This is Voice of Independent Aronia, special broadcast in the English language. Besides its regular program in the Afano Romo language, Voice of Independent Aronia produces special programs occasionally to reach its English speaking audience. By doing so, Voice of Independent Aromia aspires to educate and inform its audience on matters related to the Oromo Nation and Oromia. This is Voice of Independent Oromia. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Voice of Independent Aromia. I am Frau Galan. On our special program today, I'm joined by Professor Asafa Jalata to explore the causes of conflicts and violence currently raging in Ethiopia. Professor Jalata is known for his immeasurable contributions to our understanding of the Ethiopian state core nation, its relationship with its constituent nations and nationalities, and what sustains it. A pioneer of Oromo Studies, he is one of the founders of the Oromo Studies Association in 1986. Professor Jalata is Professor of Sociology and Global and Africana Studies at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. He is a leading scholar and a renowned expert on the politics and societies of Oromia, Ethiopia, and the wider Horn of Africa. A leading social scientist in the fields of Indigenous and Human Rights Studies, Africana and Global Studies, and Nationalism and Terrorism Studies, his research focuses on identifying and explaining the chains of historical and political economic forces that shape racial inequality, development, underdevelopment, and social national movements on local, regional, and global levels. Professor Jalata has published and edited eight books. He has also published over five dozen refereed articles and book chapters in various national and international journals. Two of his books, Contending Nationalism of Oromia and Ethiopia, Struggling for Statehood, Sovereignty, and Multinational Democracy, and Oromia in Ethiopia, State Formation and Ethno-National Conflict, are most relevant to our topic, which is causes of conflicts and violence in Ethiopia. We reached Professor Jalata in Washington, D.C. He will be speaking to us today. Thank you, Professor Jalata, for honoring voice of independent Oromia by making time to speak with me and my audience on this timely topic, which is the causes of conflict and violence in Ethiopia. I want to thank you once again on behalf of our listeners. Thank you, Raul, for inviting me. And also, I extend my thanks to Voice of Independent Romia. It's a great pleasure uh, to discuss these issues with you, Raul. The pleasure is all ours. Um, if we may dive right into the questions that we have for you, uh, Professor Gelato. Just so that our listeners gain some background information about the politics of the Ethiopian state, what is the current system of government in Ethiopia? We are aware that Ethiopia became a multinational federal republic with bicameral parliament in 1995. But what does all that mean? What kind of governance system was in place before that? And what was wrong with it that needed replacing with the current system? The Ethiopian state is a an authoritarian terrorist government that many people don't understand. It is also a colonial government when you look at it from the perspective of the colonized population groups such as Kimant, Agao, Oromo, Somali, Sidama, Walaita and others. It is a colonial and or terrorist government. When you consider the proper Abyssinia, where the ruling class, uh, Amara and the Tigrians, have been emerging, uh, it has been authoritarian. But recently, in fact, even it turned to be terrorist on the Tigrian population group. So it's very difficult even to call a government. This is a collection of bandits coming together to control the state in order to dominate, exploit, dehumanize people. If you closely look at what they are doing, the state elites are terrorists. They don't care about human beings. They don't care about society. They don't care about anything. What do they care is to dominate, control, terrorize, and exploit. 
So this elite's main concern is to dominate politics, economics, cultural systems. It's not only that also they want to control language, religion, everything. So these state elites or the, the government want to dominate everything, uh, particularly uh, in the colonized regions such as Oromia. So it's a very difficult, if you, anybody knows what the government is, government is a, a system that is created to protect, help people, to provide service. But the Ethiopian government is not this kind of government. Its main goal is to extract surplus from the people uh, and to do whatever it wants to the people. So this government has been uh, created by Minilik, it has been continued by Haile Selassie, Mangistu Halamariam, Malla Zinawi, and Abi Ahmed. Only leaders would change, but the system remains the same. So since the Tigrayan population groups are small in size, when they come to power in order to get legitimacy, uh, the Tigrayan elites or the TPLF or the Tigrayan-led government with its puppet organizations created a fake federation in which the Tigrayan elites control everything from above. And this is not really a true federation. There is no, in, in, a, in, a, in an empire, this is an empire also, Ethiopia is an empire, it's not a country, by the way. That's why different areas face different kind of policies, different kinds of approaches. There is no also parliament, really is a, a rubber stamp parliament that was created by force. It was not elected by the people, from the people. Uh, there is no federation, there is no democracy, there is no parliament in Ethiopia, but all these things are fake. And then it's very amazing that the Amara elites who were replaced by Tigrians, when they are trying to come to power, they want to blame a federation system in Ethiopia when there is no federation, there is no democracy, there is no anything like that. So they are creating false narratives. We call in sociology, fallacy of causal location, which means creating false reasons for what they try to do. So the Amara elites uh, try to convince the world that Ethiopia is facing a problem because of a federation system, which is not true. And uh, we can explore further when you continue your questions, Frau. Well, traditional wisdom has it that Ethiopia, as we know it today, has a 3,000 years history. You were telling us that Ethiopia, as we know it today, has a history of not even 150 years. So what would you attribute such a big discrepancy between traditional wisdom and reality as you described it? This 3,000 years claim is mythology that claims to justify something that didn't exist. Uh, the Ethiopian Empire was created during the last decades of the 19th century by the alliance of Ethiopian warlords like Menelik and the Johannes and the European imperial systems like Great Britain, France, and Italy. It's just less than 150 years. So in Abyssinia proper, Amaras and the Tigrians were fighting one another, each other, and then they created a system in Abyssinia proper by destroying people like Imant, Ago, and others, and after establishing their system over there, they extended to Oromia and the Sudama, Hadia, Burage, and other colonized areas. Then when they extended the system, they created, they, this elite created settler colonialism. What is settler colonialism? Sending armed people and settling among the population and controlling them. The first thing they did was to expropriate the lands of the indigenous people, particularly, they took over Oromia, they partitioned Oromo lands, they created garrison cities in Oromia, and these garrison cities they established 
armed settlers, and also they recruited Oromo collaborators in order to control, dominate the Oromo people, to continue to dominate, to humiliate, to destroy the culture, to loot the resources, to dehumanize, to practice racism on people like Oromo. So this fake 300,000 years is to explain, rationalize, and the legitimate colonial system that they have been trying to maintain. So these people are really known for falsehood. Uh, they confuse history with mythology. They confuse ideology with scientific claims. So uh, simply put, it is just propaganda. The history under this history is a propaganda. It's not true history. Well, we often hear repeated claims or statements about the current multinational federal parliamentary system in Ethiopia. On the one hand, there are those that would have us believe that it is the primary cause of Ethiopia's current rampant conflicts and violence. On the other hand, we have countries like India, Belgium, Switzerland, and Canada that are living together, not just in peace, but thrive under that system. In fact, Canada and Switzerland were ranked first and fourth in the 2021 U.S. News Best Countries ranking. How can a similar system of governance be a cause for conflicts and violence in Ethiopia, but a source of stability and prosperity in others? What would you please, if you don't mind, explain this to our listeners? You raised uh, very interesting examples. Canada, Switzerland, India, where multinational democracy or multinational Federation has been practiced, where people peacefully lived side by side without terrorizing one another, without killing one another. And these countries are prosperous. Of course, India is a little bit different. Uh, true federation, which is based on democracy, equality and equity, cannot be cause for violence, for conflict, for war. Uh, rather, it promotes justice, fairness, peace. First of all, as I mentioned before, there is no true federation in Ethiopia. They just claim it is there. But people who have been colonized, are some of them are trying to create a true federation. They are, they are struggling to create true federation based on genuine democracy, based on human rights. But these Amara elites are against that. They try to oppose it. The main reason is to maintain their privilege. As I already mentioned before, they have been dominating the elites, not Amara masses, not ordinary Amara masses that we are talking. These elites have been dominating politics, economics, culture, religion, language and everything, they have been dominating everything. They deny all that reality, they deny that the Ethiopian state or Ethiopian elites have not been dominating everything. They are saying in the Ethiopian empire, they don't call it empire, but they call it the country. There is no hierarchies. Everybody is equal. The government is uh, treating everybody the same way, which is not true if you study systematically the history of that country. They are denying. The main reason is to continue their domination and the exploitation, particularly the Oromo. Their main, their main fear is the Oromo question, because the Oromo are the largest population group in the empire. Uh, the Oromo are demanding their rights. The Oromo are fighting for rights of self-determination. They are very much concerned about that. So they want to stop the Oromo people from asking for their rights to self-determination. So they have to oppose everything uh, about federation because if there is a genuine federation, if there is equality and equity among different population groups, they cannot continue to dominate. For example, their language cannot be the only official language because there is no reason why Amharic is the only official language. Their population is less than the Oromo population. The Oromo language have more speakers. There is no reason. So they, they want to maintain, they want to uh, partition Oromia 
which is a fake federation. They want to dismantle Oromia. They want to restore uh, the unitary system, which was divided into provincial areas. They want to totally go back to the era of Iris Lase and Mangisto Alamaria. And that's why they are opposing a federal system. If the multinational federal system is not the boogeyman, it is made out to be by some, and not the primary cause for the current problems of the Ethiopian state, then what is causing the current rampant conflicts and violence in the country? Why have we had parts of Oromia under martial law for almost three years? Why are Ethiopian security forces supported by Eritrean forces burning farms and torching houses? with residents inside. Oromia, Tagre, Beneshangal, Gumaz. Why is the root cause for such immense suffering of oppressed nations and nationalities in Ethiopia, if not the multinational federal system? Probably you raised a lot of questions. Uh, if I don't address all of them, uh, please remind me. Uh, first of all, I briefly mentioned in my previous discussion the relationship is between uh, the Abyssinians or Amara elites and the colonized population group is colonial relationship. The colonized people, particularly the Oromo, want to end this colonial relationship. The Oromo want to determine their destiny by using international law, which allows uh, the right to self-determination. And these people are against that. They are against the rights of the Oromo people. The Oromos are uh, developing their nationalism or national Oromo. Uh, they are being united. They are restoring their identity, their culture. They are standing more or less as one people, except a few of them who are collaborators to the Abyssinians, sometimes with Amara or sometimes with the Tigrians. The majority of the Oromo people want to determine their, their destiny. And uh, now the conflict between the colonizers and the colonizers is being intensified, particularly in Oromo. The Oromo Liberation Army, which recognized the nature of the Ethiopian state, uh, refused to submit to colonial authority. They continue to fight for the Oromo to implement the right to self-determination. So the more the Oromo resisted, the more the colonial regime get angry and they start to establish martial law or command posts in Oromia. Uh, by the way, these are not simple things because the new Naftanya government would allow its soldiers to kill anybody they want, to execute people in the public places, to cut necks of people in the field hyena, to rape women, to confiscate cattle, to burn houses, to do whatever they want. In the 21st century, when even animals have rights, the Oromo people are not treated as human beings. They have never been treated as human beings since their colonization. They have been considered as second-class citizens. Different names were given to them. Uh, I don't have time to list what they called, what they did to the Oromo people. They considered them as subhuman, therefore they didn't consider them as human beings. They did to the Oromo what they can't do to the Amaras. Now we cannot say uh, that they don't to Tigrians. They start to do the same thing to the Tigrians recently. But these command forces have been intended to suppress the Oromo struggled for liberation. And uh, they started in Wallaga, they started in Guji, Central Oromia. Now I think uh, the command reports are extended to 10 areas of the Oromo areas because the Oromo people are not taking marching order from the regime. So the Oromo struggle started to have maturity, start to resist colonial brutality. Uh, consequently, the Oromo Liberation Army existed. 
continue to exist and to expand, the more the Oromo Liberation Army start to expand this area of influence, the more the regime start to expand command forces, expanding terrorism. And on top of that, the Ethiopian soldiers could not handle the Oromo Liberation Army, therefore the regime invited Eritrean soldiers, Amara militias, who knows whom they are going to call in the future. If other countries are willing, they are going to invite to bring to Oromia to annihilate the Oromo Liberation Army and the Oromo people. There is no sympathy. They don't see the Oromos as citizens of the country. Their brutality, the way they treat, the way the Ethiopian soldiers treat Oromo children, Oromo women, Oromo resources, abundantly demonstrate that there is colonial relationship between Oromia and Ethiopia. So after they failed to totally control the Oromo struggle, the Abi regime extended similar tactics to Tigray. It declared war on Tigray. It invited foreign forces such as Eritrean forces, United Arab Emirates, drones, Amara militia, to fight against five or to six million population. The main goal of Abiy government is not only to fight against the TPLF, as it is demonstrating through its practices, it wants to destroy the Tigrayan population through uh, looting, killing, destroying infrastructure, hospitals, destroying everything, forcing people to flee, and engaging the massive human rights violation and the genocide. So the world population starts to pay attention to these conditions because of many reasons. One, the TPLF was a colonial government, as far as the Oromos are concerned. By the way, this colonial government did similar things that the Abiy government is doing to the Oromo. They were fascist to the Oromo too. But now when the Tigrayan population are attacked and annihilated, we are sympathetic. The Oromo people are sympathetic because despite the fact that the TPLF was the enemy of the Oromo, the TPLF and OPDO were the enemy of the Oromo. Both TPLF and OPDO that claims PP today or Prosperity Party, they collaborated to engage in terrorizing the Oromo and committing genocide on the Oromo. Now the PP, that the servant of the TPLF is becoming uh, powerful, it is trying to totally destroy the Tigrayan population. So the world is start to become sympathetic because these are minority group, if you consider the size of the population, and they are on the verge of destruction. So the world is sympathetic to the Tigrayan population. Also the TPLF had friends around the world. Uh, they looted resources from Romania. They are rich, they are many. Uh, they could influence the world. But as far as the Romans are concerned, the world is really, they briefly mentioned. Uh, this is a very serious problem. Uh, you can see how the world is unfair. When it comes to the Romo, the world has never been sympathetic to the Romo cause. When they were terrorized by TPLF and OPDO, they never cared. When they are being terrorized now, they care very less. And also it is the responsibility of the Oromo. The Oromo should ask themselves why, why we couldn't influence the world, like the TPLF. We should ask ourselves. So the more the Oromo intensify their struggle for liberation, the more the people, the world will start to organize and it will be sympathetic. Uh, that will take some time, I guess. Uh, as a scholar who has studied Ethiopia for decades, where do you think Ethiopia is heading? Can it survive the scale of conflict and violence it is experiencing today and come out of it as a unified state at the end of it? There are those that predict that it is headed for a former Yugoslavia-style messy breakup. Would you agree why or why not? What possible solutions would you propose for Ethiopia's problems? 
this is very difficult to precisely predict about the future, but let me briefly say what I think. Ethiopia is heading to disintegration. Uh, the Ethiopian state is already a failed state, there is no question. Because it's a failed state, it cannot satisfy the demands and the needs of population. And the many people, different population groups, are demanding their rights. And the Habasha politicians want to want continue to the same thing. For example, during the so-called election, the political parties that are competing are children of Nantanyas. Their collaborators, Amaras, and their Oromo collaborators, or Oromos who are uh, brainwashed by the ideology of Ethiopianism. So there is no compromise, the politics of compromise in Ethiopia. So in the absence of compromise, Ethiopia is going to face similar conditions, uh, probably like Somalia or formerly Yugoslavia. In that conditions, many possibilities. You can predict many possibilities. One is war and the conflict. The second is genocidal, gross human rights violations. The third thing is continuous crisis, or the similar conditions that exist now will continue. But uh, Ethiopia is not going to be the same. The Ethiopian empire, one way or the other, is going to be dismantled. Ethiopian colonialism is going to be dismantled. The relationship between different population groups is going to be redefined. And uh, I, I think that there is a possibility that many independent states will emerge on the grave of the Ethiopian empire. Or there is a possibility that if the world intervene, different independent nations form their own state and they create a federation, true federation within uh, the Horn of Africa. Uh, this true federation uh, must allow people to determine their destiny. Uh, there must be democracy. There must be rule of law. So there are many possibilities that would happen as this crisis continue. This fake election is going to introduce many conflicts, many challenges to the Ethiopian Empire. In addition to political crisis, there is also economic failure. People are not producing, people are not farming, not trading, and the world is putting embargo on Ethiopia because of its violation of human rights. So the crisis is going to be multiplied, and the Ethiopian empire will be disintegrated and transformed in one way or the other. That are my predictions. Thank you so much for your time with Voice of Independent Oromia, Professor Asafa Jalata. Uh, with that, I, I want to thank you all for watching our special program in English with Professor Asafa Jalata and say goodbye until we meet again on another Voice of Independent Oromia program. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Frau, and the Voice of Independent Oromia for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. I have